So this is a presentation I call Worlds in Collision. It has to do with Israel, the Middle East, and the West. And it's something I've been working on for over a year now. I started doing it before 9-11. Every time I come back to America to speak, I have to change it because something else is happening. Actually, the first place I taught it was in New York in June before 9-11, and I came back two weeks after, and the atmosphere was a little bit different, to say the least. But one of the reasons why we created this presentation is because there's definitely a huge lack in depth and understanding of what's going on. Now, one of the problems with being an American, it's the best country on earth besides Israel, of course, but one of the problems with being an American is we're very impatient. We want to know everything very quickly. We want to understand what's going on in the world in a 30-second soundbite in the news. And the Middle East is an incredibly complicated situation. There are no simple solutions to it. And because we don't understand it, we lose all perspective to the real nature of the conflict, what the real issues are, what the solution is, and we can't hope to be successful in dealing with the issue unless we have depth in it. Now, I always say, if you're doing business in Japan as a Westerner, and I know most Americans, you know, I don't know how much people travel or don't travel, but most people in the West think that everyone in the world thinks like them. Has anyone been to Japan? You know, Japanese mentality is very different from Americans. If you want to be successful in business with Japanese, you've got to understand how they think. What fuels their country? Honor, loyalty. America's the opposite. It's individualism, take the initiative. When you look at the Middle East, it's such a different part of the world. You know, you visit Israel, it's like a little New York in the middle of the Middle East. But that's not what the Middle East is all about. So I designed this presentation to try and give a little bit of depth. Now, of course, even if I had the full amount of time, and this is a presentation that takes about an hour and 15 minutes, and I have about a half an hour, even with that, it's only meant as an introduction to show people how really little they need to know and how much more they need to know. And I've given everyone, you all have handouts. Um, don't start reading them all. Actually, it's a Jewish audience. Open everything. Read everything right away. Okay? If I tell you not to, you're going to do it anyway. The handouts have a lot of interesting information. Most importantly, at the back, there's a whole bunch of websites. I think the most important thing, I'll say it now and I'll say it at the end, is people have to be educated, number one, ourselves. And we have to be able to point people in the right direction. Because, again, this is not the audience I think that needs that much educating. But there are plenty of people around us, both fellow Jews and non-Jews who are being bombarded by the media and Israel is being trashed, I'm sure you're all aware, except for Fox News. If you look at CNN, which stands for Completely Nauseating Nonsense, or BBC, Biased British Crap, or NPR, Nauseating Palestinian Rhetoric, it's just we're getting destroyed. We have to go on the offensive here, and every one of us has to be a little ambassador for the Jewish people and for Israel. So I just want to give you a little taste of some of the material that we present in this presentation. And if people are interested in finding out more, again, I give you some sources and I'll be happy to. Uh, recommend other things to read, books, websites. If people want to teach the material, you should let me know. We're in the process of putting together a whole presentation called the Middle East Unplugged. So we'd let, we'd, I'm sure we'll bring it to this community in the not-too-distant future. Let's just define a little terms, because what's most lacking, I think, in the Western mind is an understanding of Islam. You know, we talk about Islam. People are aware, you know, Islam begins in the Middle East. Okay, but not all Muslims are Arabs. We, people know that, right? It's, what's the largest Islamic nation in the world? Indonesia, right? There's plenty of countries that are Muslim but not Arab today. Okay. But it begins in the Middle East. And anyone know the starting year for Islam? What's their year one? 622 is when their calendar starts, CE. So it's relatively new religion. Look at Judaism, which goes back to Abraham 3,800 years ago. They're relatively newcomers on the block. But there's a few pieces of information I think people really need to understand about Islam to begin to even get your fingers around what's going on with Israel and the Palestinians and how that's related to what's going on with the Muslim world in general because it's all interconnected and we don't see that connection because the news doesn't want to talk about it. So again, to deal with Islam in five minutes is not doing it justice, but a few basic pieces of information. And this is really important because I often find the most common question I get asked when I teach this material is, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, is that legitimate Islam or a perversion of it? Has that question crossed anyone's minds? You know, is that what Islam teaches? So I'll tell you the answer. The answer is yes and no. The answer is Islam can manifest itself in a wide variety of forms. Okay? From very tolerant to very extreme. They are all legitimate forms of Islam. Okay? So it's not like they've subverted the religion and taken it. It's definitely what you're seeing in the Muslim world today, in places like Af Afghanistan and Iran, is the most extreme form. But it is mainstream Islam. It, is, it, it has within it certain basic tenets that all Muslims share. And I'd just like to share a little bit of some basic Islam 101 with people. First of all, super important point to understand. Islam divides the world into two. There's that part of the world which is called Dar al Islam, and that part of the world which is called Dar al Kharab. Dar al Islam is the world of Islam. What does Islam mean? To submit. 
It means to submit. A Muslim is one who submits. What are you submitting to? It's not your tax returns. What are you submitting to? You're submitting to the word of God as given by whom? Muhammad. The most important figure in Islam is a guy by the name of Muhammad from 570 to 632 CE. He, if you call him the founder, Muslims get really upset. Okay. He's the person who supposedly in Islamic tradition gets the final revelation, meaning the Muslims understand the world as follows. God revealed himself to the Jews. The Jews blew it. Then the Christians came along. They blew it. Then Muhammad came along. He's called in Arabic Rasul Allah the friend, the messenger of God. His prophecy is the final prophecy. This is the final revelation, which means the whole world, and this is the final revelation of God, the whole world has to accept that. When you start to put these things in your brain, you'll see why the Muslim world behaves the way it does. So the whole world is ultimately destined to accept the final revelation of God through the prophet Muhammad. Okay? And therefore the world, until it gets to the acceptance of Muhammad and his word, and everyone becoming Muslim will be divided into two. The world of Islam, Dar al-Islam, and Dar al-Kharab, the world of the sword, or the world of war. The world, that part of the world which isn't Muslim yet, yet being the important word to focus on here. Which has to be brought to Islam via what mechanism? Anyway, not necessarily, death is a little bit harsh. It's called jihad. Everyone heard the word jihad? Which doesn't mean holy war, it means struggle. The traditional meaning of jihad I'll uh, check with, and I'll give you one name, you should all buy a couple books of his, Dr. Bernard Lewis. In, it's struggle to bring the world under the word of God, which you can use force to do it. The notion, by the way, that Muslims can, spreading their religion by making everyone convert or die is overstated. But they put lots of pressure on people throughout history. We just don't have time to go into the historical process. But when we understand this idea, we already understand a very important part of what fundamental Islamic worldview contains. The, uh, the idea that we have to conquer the world. Now, if you know a little bit of Islamic history, you know that early on, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries, Islam was on the march. They conquer all the Middle East, all North Africa. They get to Spain, 7-11, a date all Americans remember because of the convenience store. Remember, the Moors cross the Straits of Gibraltar and conquer Spain for the next 700 years. Part of Spain, all or part of Spain will be Muslim. Okay. If not for a battle in 732 called the Battle of Poitiers, where Charles Martel stops the Moors in the Pyrenees, who knows? Maybe Islam would have overrun the entire Christian world and all of history would be different. But we're not going to go into who knows and what ifs. But we have this idea of tremendous expansion. But let's jump ahead in history. Around the year 1000, what was going on in the world? The Crusades. The Christian world counterattacks. What's happened in the last thousand years? Who's dominated human history? Who has the great empires in the last thousand years? The West. The Christian West. Now look into the Middle East in the last hundred years. Prior to 1918, who controlled Israel? Okay, everyone's aware. This is basic. Real. Everyone's aware that there was no Iraq, you know, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel. Those are creations of the British and French post World War One. We know that, right? They're not ancient countries. They live, they exist in a very ancient part of the world. The Ottoman Turkish Empire was the last major Muslim empire in the world, but it was the sick man of Europe. It was, and the rest of the world was controlled by the West. What happened in 1917? The end of 1917, end of World War One. The Turks who side with the Germans lose the war. They lose their empire. They lose Israel. The British get a hold of it. The British and the French chop up the Middle East, and they create all the countries we have today. Now let's try and think our way into the minds of Muslims in the last 100 years. How do you think you'd feel, given what I told you about Islamic worldview? How would you feel knowing that British and French Christians are in your country? Not a good thought. You know, it goes against your theology. What's well, supposed to be? We're supposed to be on the march. But let's jump ahead even further in history. 1979, what happens? Major event in the Middle East. What was in 1979 besides the peace treaty with Israel? And yeah, the, sorry? Shah. Excellent. The fall of the Shah of Iran, who was replaced by whom? A fundamentalist Islamic regime, Ayatollah Khomeini. Then you have Beirut. Right? Remember the U.S. Marines? They blew up the barracks. The Marines flee. Soviet Union thrown out of Afghanistan. Israel two years ago leaving the security zone in South Lebanon. 1991, what was that? The Gulf War. Who won? Saddam Hussein. He's dead. He's still in power. He thinks he won and he's still there. So what do you think the Muslims view is the situation in the last few decades? Compared to what was before being occupied by the colonial Western Christian powers, now what's the situation? We are on the march. The tide has turned. We're coming back. Now, it's interesting. If you look at what happened since 9-11, and no one took, no one took um, our friend in, uh, Osama bin Laden seriously. But if you look at what happened since 9-11 and start to look into how the Muslim world has been speaking, you see this is exactly what they're saying. Now, what I want to do, by the way, is read a series of quotes, because it's much better you hear this from the horse's mouth. 
what basically the Islamic world thinks of the West and how is that connected to Israel. So if you wouldn't mind, please, just opening up the quotes I gave you. Look at quote number one on page number four. Here's the most wanted person in the world at the moment, Osama bin Laden. And but I'll tell you something as a historian. One thing I've learned is to take what people say seriously. Okay, many of the most evil people in history are very intellectual. They practice what they preach. They live by their ideas. And you've got to listen to what they say carefully. Look at what bin Laden is saying in quote number one. For more than seven years, the United States is occupying the lands of Islam and its holiest territories, Arabia, plundering its riches, overwhelming its rulers, humiliating its people, threatening its neighbors, and using its bases in the, in the peninsula as a spearhead to fight against the neighboring Islamic peoples. Why is Osama bin Laden attacking the United States? What's he focusing on? The American occupation of the Middle East, specifically what piece of real estate? No, Saudi Arabia. Which why is Saudi Arabia so bad? Oil. Not because of oil. Mecca and Medina. Mecca is the place only Muslims are allowed in. The Americans are they're not occupying it, but in their mind that foreign foreigners and by the way in Islamic law a non-Muslim monotheist is called a dhimmi. In Islamic law, a dhimmi is someone who's allowed to live amongst Muslims because he believes in one God, but because he doesn't believe in Muhammad, he's not a Muslim, he has to have set re curtailed legal rights. He's under our thumb. So the dhimmi Western American power should occupy Saudi Arabia? Holiest sites in Islam is outrageous. Now, again, if I had more time, I'd go into more quotes and talk about what's really going on. You'll have to take my word for it. What you see Osama bin Laden saying and the Islamic right in the world is attacking America as what? The symbol of the great Western power which stands in the way of what? Right. The Islamization, the continuing revolution, the ultimate victory of Islam. America is the only right. America is the only superpower. Who in the world is willing to go in now and take out Islamic fundamentalists? The United States and England will like send two Harrier jump jets. No, I kid you not. So the, Osama bin Laden is correct. But the point is, is it's very much, America is being hated because it's a symbol, and the conflict is very much focused on the idea of Islam. It's, very, it's being Islamicized. It's part of the revolution, the big historical picture. Who's not mentioned in this quote? Israel. Israel. And by the way, this is interesting. Osama bin Laden never mentions Israel until post 9-11. Now he thinks he can get some points by driving a wedge between Israel and America. America is being attacked because of its support for Israel. It's a huge mistake. We have to make sure people understand that is not the issue. The issue is a much bigger issue of Islam versus the West. And Israel is just being viewed as the front line state. For instance, jump ahead. Now, if we, we microtize the conflict, because if you deal with the Islamic world as a whole, where are the Palestinians in all of this? Go to page five. Look at quote number two. This is Hafez Agbar Bagruti. He's the editor of Ahat Ajadida, which is the official Palestinian newspaper in Gaza. He says, history does not remember the United States, but it remembers Iraq, the cradle of civilization, and Palestine, the cradle of religions. History remembers every piece of Arab land because it is the bosom of human civilization. On the other hand, the murderers of humanity, the creators of a barbaric culture, and the bloodsuckers of nations are doomed to death and destined to shrink to a microscopic size like Micronesia. Poor Micronesia. By the way, the best voting record on Israel besides America is Micronesia, you should know. It's interesting because it was an American protectorate. But Anyway... What's going on here? What are the Palestinians saying about America? Do people see it's the same thing? It's just a mini version of the larger Islamic hostility towards the West, focusing on America as the only superpower. So we see it's Islam. It's very much, you don't hear Palestinian nationalism, occupation. It's all the, the big war, the struggle, the revolution, the final showdown. Jump down to, court, to page number five. Look at number one. This is Wadi Gunam. He's an Islamic cleric from Egypt living in Brooklyn. Look what he says. The conflict with the Jews is not over land, but one of religion. Suppose the Jews said, Palestine, you, meaning the Muslims, can take it. Would it then be okay? What do we tell them? No, the problem is belief. It is not a problem of land. It's not the Palestinian people. You say, it's a smokescreen. The real issue is, Islamic, is Islam versus the West, and Israel is the front-line state. Look at quote number four on page six. Let me just explain what they're quoting from. They're quoting from a hadith. A hadith 
is collections of the, it's the, 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 the sayings and the acts of the Prophet Muhammad. This is not some obscure Islamic source. Look at quote number four at the top of page six. And it is given, the day of resurrection will not arrive until the Muslims make war against the Jews and kill them. Until the Jew hiding behind a rock and a tree, and a rock and a tree will say, O Muslim, O servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. This hadith clarifies to us the characteristics of the campaign between us and the Jews. The tree and the rock do not say, O Palestinian, O Arab, O resident of the Middle East. Rather, they say, O Muslim, servant of Allah. Did you see what I'm focusing on? It's being Islamicized. It's a holy war against the West. Israel's the front line state. Now, by the way, what else do the tree and the rock say over here? They don't say, O Zionist, O Israeli. What do they say? Jew. O Jew. Which, is, which shows you a very scary point that Muslims don't, I'm not saying all Muslims, but the, the ones who want to kill people don't care whether you live in America or Israel, whether you're pro Sharon or pro Perez, whether you support the state or not, anti Zionist, pro Zionist. You are all viewed, we are all viewed as a common enemy because we represent something much more than the state of Israel, the Jewish people, which is the front line Western colonial lackey of America. So the main point I want people to focus on, and this is super important to understand, is the real nature of the conflict, the connection between 9-11 and what's going on in the Middle East in general, Israel, the Palestinians. It's all part and parcel of a much bigger conflict, Islamic fundamentalism versus the West. America is being targeted because it is the symbol and the last superpower that can stand in the way of this revolution, and Israel is the mini version of it. What do they call America, the Iranians? You know what they call them? Sorry? The great Satan. What do they call Israel? The little Satan. They're saying it right there. Just a little. We're the front of the sword sticking into the Islamic Middle East. Now, by the way, all of this is lost in the media. You don't... Has anyone heard this? Like CNN gets up and says this? Never. Why don't they say it? Because A, they hate Israel, and B, it's not PC to say use the M word. Even George Bush, you know, who gets up there and talks about they've got to fight against evil and is willing to take a stand. Right after 9-11, you know, he makes the axis of evil and has to throw North Korea. You know, virtually every conflict, I saw a statistic, I think of the 40 conflicts in the world today, 35 of them have to do with Islam and Muslim states. So why does George Bush have to throw Korea into the, the pot? This is the axis of evil, Korea, a country that can barely get its electric grid up. Okay? I mean, seriously. It's because it's not politically correct. No one wants to make a holy war. But I'm not a member of the State Department. I don't have to worry about being tactful. But we have to understand that there's a real threat going on here, a huge threat of Islamic fundamentalism, which has to be contained because it's more dangerous than what was going on with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. You guys remember, I have an audience of, you know, I get like guys in their 20s. In the Cold War, they think of it as like, you know, something when they didn't have hot water for a shower one day. <laughs> Remember for 50 years, Cold War? Remember containment, George Kennan? You know, we got to keep the Soviet, the communist, the domino theory. And it worked. Believe me, in the Cold War, remember, no one wanted to use their nuclear weapons because if one person pressed the button, the world was destroyed a thousand times over. If 9-11 showed us anything, it's the, the Islamic fundamentalism makes the Soviet Union seem like kids play. These are people who are not afraid to use weapons of mass destruction because they're not afraid to die. They don't care about the revolution to physically conquer America. They care about what they think is doing God's will. This is a point we have to be able to explain to people. You have to be educated what Islam says and get that over. But the other point I want to focus on, and I'm really sorry we have so little time to go into it, is why is all this stuff obfuscated in the news? You never hear any of this. As a matter of fact, when you go to, like you turn on your newspaper, first of all, when you look at a map of the crisis, if you open, look in the front here. Go to page... Go to this map of Israel. Whenever you get CNN on television, this is what you see. You know, I have, to, I have to hand it to the Arabs, and they do it because, unfortunately, the Western media is so anti-Israel. With their help, they have done the best job of totally of political historical revisionism in human history. The entire Middle East crisis, besides no one having any depth in it, has been reduced geographically to this. This is what you see on television, right, this map? Mighty Israel, the size of New Jersey, mighty superpower of the Middle East, crushing teeny tiny Palestinian enclaves with nothing, you know, a couple of guys with Kalashnikovs. Everyone, this is correct. This is the picture you see? What is the picture you should see? Flip over this way. Teeny tiny Israel, the size of New Jersey, nine miles wide before 1967, from Kalkilia to Tukaram, surrounded by 300 million Arabs in 22 Arab Islamic states. Okay, that is the conflict. Okay, that's what no one ever sees today. And by re what they've done is so brilliant because now it seems like if you look at, if you ask people on the street, why is there not peace in the Middle East? First of all, it's Israel's fault. 
We appreciate that. The Palestinian, the whole history of the Middle East, and the reason why there's such instability is because Israel is oppressing the Palestinians, which is tremendously untrue. But more importantly than that, if we go to, there should be a thing here, misconceptions in here somewhere. Here it is on page number nine. The spin doctors of the Middle East had managed to get everyone to not only not understand the historical context of the problem, the geopolitical nature of the problem, the balance of forces, but they managed to get into everyone's mind that there are four reasons why there's no peace in the Middle East. And they basically go down to, one, Israel's a foreign occupying power. They have no right to be there. Two, the Palestinians are legitimate people. Okay, and they're not having their national aspirations met. And the third big one is, of course, it's the occupation. If Israel just stopped occupying these people and oppressing them, you heard this stuff, right? This is not new. The Palestinians are great. You know, it's a big one of the problems. They're very good. They don't live in a democratic country. They don't. They don't have freedom of press. They have to say certain things. And they're all, even if they don't like each other in the Palestinian camp, they all are smart enough to know that they have to say the same thing. The big problem being Jews and propaganda is terrible. First of all, to get two Jews to agree on anything is impossible. <laughs> and Jews can't explain anything simply. It's like you know, Talmudic logic. You know, look at George. We should all learn from George Bush. You know. You ever, you ever watch George Bush say, they're good guys, they're bad guys, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, and we're going to kill them. <laughs> Works. Jews are like, well, you have to understand. No, it's, it's, it's a very big problem. So part of the problem is our fault. Part of the problem is the media's fault. But part of the problem is this bashing away at the historical reality to recreate a new reality based on these misconceptions. And we have to be able to knock these all out of the way. Every one of you needs to be able to answer these accusations. Get a book it's in the back. It might not be in the bibliography here, but it's called Myths and Facts on the Arab-Israeli Crisis. It's the single best book to own. It gives you answers to every question you could ever hear from an Arab propagandist. First of all, the notion of Israel as a foreign occupying power. Let's go to right. There's a little timeline I gave you over here. Go back one page to page number eight. I mean, the Jewish connection to the land of Israel begins with Abraham. And I'll tell you another big mistake we as Jews make. We're afraid to use the G word or the B word. What's the G word? God. What's the B word? The Bible. You know, there are 55 million fundamentalist Christians in the United States who are just waiting for Ariel Sharon to get up and say, the God of Israel, author of the Bible, gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. They get a standing ovation. Whole states in America would stand up and clap. We don't want to use it. It's very sad, by the way. That's a side topic. But we have to, we should never, even if you're not a religious Jew, you should never be afraid to use the Bible as even a historic document to support our claim to the land. If we don't use it, the Palestinians use it and say, look, it says in the Quran, and we'll talk about it in a second, it's our holy site, it's not yours. We don't take it, they do. But the notion of Israel, just forget the religious stuff, the history. Forget Abraham even. The Jewish people have been in the land of Israel going back a very long time. If you look on the timeline here, okay, 13th century BCE. 2,000 years before Islam, the Jewish people entered the land of Israel after exiting, after leaving Egypt. We have the whole history of the first temple period, the second temple period. Yes, it's true. In the last 2,000 years since we revolted against the Romans and they destroyed the temple and exiled us, our connection physically to the land has been very limited. But that our national homeland is in Israel is outrageous. And by the way, one of the other problems we make as Jews is not being able to explain what being a Jew is. Being a Jew is not like being a Christian. It's not like being a Muslim. It is not a religious identity. Is that a shock to people? It's a peoplehood. It's a nation with a religious component to it. But we're a people. Okay? We have a land, a language, and a history. You may not have lived in Israel for 2,000 years, but it's your homeland. Okay? That's what Jewish history teaches us. That's what archaeology shows us. And our connection to Jerusalem is even more intense. You know, you always hear on CNN, whatever they talk about Jerusalem, holy to the three great monotheistic faiths. Everyone's heard that, that mantra? Fine. But it's only holiest to the Jews. You've got to be able to explain that to people. The only people in the world who've had a capital in Jerusalem in the last 3,000 years are the Jewish people, except for the Crusaders. Crusaders for a few decades, but that's a side point. Because we always knew that Jerusalem was a unique spiritual capital, the holiest spot in the world for the Jews. is not the Western Wall, by the way. Another thing you always hear, they talk about Jerusalem. The gold dome for the Muslims and the Western Wall, holiest spot in the world for the Jews. What's the holiest spot in the world for the Jews? The Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, the rock behind the Western Wall. That's the Eben Shtiyah, the drinking stone, the center of the Jewish world, the place to which all Jews ever in the world pray towards, the place where the Temple stood, because it's the only spot in the world for the Jewish people which is truly holy. Our relationship to Jerusalem is unique. Holy to Muslims? I, don't, I personally don't believe it, but if they want to say so, fine. Holy to Christians? No problem. But only holy is to the Jews. Not to make that claim is a tremendous disaster. But the notion of Jews being a foreign occupying power? Ridiculous. How about the Muslims? 
the, the Palestinians are the legitimate people. They're the ones who've had their country taken away by the colonial occupying Jews. When did the Arabs come to Israel? After the death of Muhammad in the 7th century. 2,000 years after the Jews have been there. Okay. What do they do when they get there? They make a capital there? So in fact, you've got to know, no Islamic empire ever had a capital in Jerusalem. Okay. So what's their connection to the site? Initially, none. When they come to Jerusalem, the Caliph Omar, who conquers Jerusalem in 638, he just wants to visit, visit the ruins where the Jewish temple stood. But a few decades later, the Muslims, I don't want to go into all the politics because we don't have time, but they decide they need a holy spot in Jerusalem also. Now, if you open up your Jewish Bible and you look in Jerusalem in the index, you all have an art scroll like Tanakh, great book to own. How many times do you find Jerusalem if you get a computer CD, like search of Jerusalem? You'll find it 659 times in the Jewish Bible. And if you take all the names, Moriah, Zion, whatever, over 750 times. If you take your annotated Quran and you look up Jerusalem, how many times do you find it? Zero. Zero. But there is one story in the Quran called Al-Isra, which is about Muhammad's dream and his midnight ride. He flies from Mecca to Al-Aqsa, the furthest most place. It doesn't mention where it is, and it's only a dream. In the late 7th century, the Muslims say, you know where he really flew to? Jerusalem. Then it becomes, for Sunni Muslims, their third holiest site. I don't have time to go more into the story, but it illustrates, okay, it's a holy site for them today, but it's holiest only to us. And we Jews are unique in, we've actually given another people our holiest site. And instead of turning around and saying, you know what I'm talking about, the gold dome there, that's, un, that's over the site where the temple used to stand? Instead of turning around the Muslims and saying, you know, you Jews are like the nicest people. What are they saying now? Ikram Sabri, the Mufti of Jerusalem, says it never was a Jewish site. It is a Muslim site. Jews are not allowed to pray there. Jews are not allowed to touch the Western Wall. Holy to Muslims alone. Okay. Where does Palestinian come from, the term? Romans. Right. The Romans called the land Philistia after the second century when the Jews revolted in Bar Kokhba. To punish the Jews, they changed the name of the country. Philistia. The name stuck in Western consciousness. Did it, when did the Palestinians start calling themselves Palestinian? The Philistines, by the way, who was named after? The Philistines we know historically disappear about two and a half thousand years ago. They're gone. The modern term Palestinian is resurrected right before the 67 war. They're realizing we have to create an alternative national claim to the Jews. You know what's interesting, by the way? The Palestinians, it's funny, Palestinians can't even pronounce the word Palestine because Arabs don't have a P sound. I think it's very funny, like, you know, it's like a Chinese waiter saying fried rice. It just doesn't work. I say, Palestine. They have to take courses in it because it doesn't sound good when you are trying to be representative of a country that you can't pronounce the name of. But that's a side point. But that's a modern creation, and they've done such a good job of reorienting the history, it's now, we are the original inhabitants, the Jews are the foreign occupying power. But that last argument they throw in about the occupation, it's Israel's occupation that's doing it, Israel doesn't want peace. Again, if you know a little bit of history about the Middle East, and you can see this over and over again, if you look on the timeline, Israel's always offering peace. May 14, 1948, when Israel declares itself a state. You ever seen the recordings of uh, Dave Ben-Gurion at the Tel Aviv Art Museum? He asks, he calls all the Arabs living amongst us in the borders of Israel to, to be, live as equal citizens. You know, the only Arabs who live in, with dem democracy in the Middle East are Israeli Arabs. People aware of that? And he calls on all the surrounding Arab nations to work together for the greater good of the Middle East. What was the reaction of the Arab world? An hour later, the Egyptian Air Force bombs Tel Aviv and five Arab armies invade. Okay. 1967, when Israel, in an amazing preemptive strike to keep itself from being destroyed, triples its territory in six days in June of 67, winning probably the greatest military victor, victory ever won by any country in human history, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol offers all the Arab countries, says, we will return to the borders, even though they're indefensible. We'll go back to everything, even though you were going to destroy us, just make peace with us. What was the reaction of the Arab League? The famous three no's, exactly. No negotiation, no acceptance of Israel, no peace. Okay, and in 79, of course, when one Arab breaks the mold to dot and makes peace with Israel, Israel gives every teeny square piece of territory back. But the notion of the occupation, Israel not wanting peace, all of this stuff is knocked out by the best example is in 2000, when Ehud Barak was still prime minister. People remember this? He offered up everything to Yasser Arafat. He said, we will re remove ourselves from the West Bank and Gaza. Okay. We will give, except for keeping a couple little percent of territory, and we'll recompensate you by giving you land in Israel so you get down to the square foot the same amount of land. We will redivide Jerusalem. What was Yasser Arafat's reply? No. No. Not enough. And by the way, at the same time, same time as, as Assad in Syria was also offered the Golan Heights back, and at the last minute he changed his mind and asked for more, and it fell apart. So what you got to see is the occupation would have ended a long time ago. It was never started by us. There was problems with, before Israel occupied the West Bank in Gaza, what was causing all the problems? There was no refugee problem then. 
it's clear that if you look at the conflict more in depth, and again, I apologize because I'm racing through the information, you see that what's not going on here is any of this myths. Okay, this is all smokescreen. Okay, what the word that best characterizes the, is the Arab reaction to the Jews is rejection. Rejection, rejection, rejection. And if you put that in the context of Islamic fundamentalism, then you see where it's coming from. In Islamic worldview, it can never be that a piece of territory which from 638 until 1917 was controlled by Muslims can ever be allowed to go back to dimmy second class Jews. Can't be. Can't be. Now, so that's a little bit negative. That's a bit scary, though, a little bit pessimistic. What are we going to do? These people are never going to accept us? That's not so true either. We see people have made peace with Israel. You know why? In the words of Zeb, uh, Zeb Jabotinsky, who was the famous religious, famous Zionist revisionist leader, he said, Jabotinsky had a theory called the Iron Wall. He said the Arabs will only make peace with us when they realize they can't destroy us. And I had to tell you, as a student of the Middle East, that is a, a very true piece of, piece of wisdom. When, we get, when you offer things to them, and now remember like Japanese doing business with them? You ever try and buy something in the Shuk? Have you ever to Israel? You know, like you go in, like the Jokos, the guy walks, runs into the Arab market, and he says, look, I have no time. I know how it's going to work. I'm going to say, they're going to say 100, I'm going to say 10. They're going to say 90, I'm going to say 20. You're going to say 70, I'm going to say 30. Let's call it $50. And the Arab says, 75. <laughs> you start offering things, and the immediate, that you're immediately moved off of your red line position. And it's a big, Israel's not negotiating well. But the point is, is you understand the mentality of the Arabs and how it works, you've got to be tough. Offering things is only leading to more greater demands, more violence. It's a vicious, vicious cycle going on. I don't want to get into solutions for the Middle East, and we're almost out of time, but I just want to focus on a few points at the end that I think we all need to understand. Besides being able to explain this and have the background and history, the major thing I think we all need to do in terms of writing our congressmen, our senators, and our representatives, and speaking to our fellow Jews and non-Jews, is to get people to refocus on what the real conflict is here. We're in a war. There's a direct connection between... I'm not talking about who's funding Yasser Arafat and whether Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda is operating in the West Bank, which they believe they are. That's not the issue. But we're in a war, whether you're in America, whether you're an American Jew or an Israeli or an American Christian, okay, or a Christian Arab, really. And they don't, unfortunately, they don't see that. They're too scared to say anything. But it's a much bigger conflict. And we have to appreciate that America is not doing Israel any favors. The, the Arab propagandists are starting to realize the best thing they can do is drive a wedge between Israel and America by saying, you know why America is being targeted? It's support for Israel. God forbid that idea ever takes hold in the Western media. A, it will drive a huge wedge between Israel and its only real ally in the world. B, it could lead to a big split in the Jewish community. Do what, who am I supporting? Okay. But most importantly, it could, it could lead to, the biggest problem it could lead to is not dealing with the issue that needs to be dealt with. You already see all of Europe doesn't want to take on any, any part of the Middle East. Not to contain Islamic fundamentalism. Years from now, people will be sitting there after some capital is blown up by a nuclear weapon and going, I can't believe we didn't take you know, Sodom out when we had a chance. Okay, that's a huge mistake. We have to get our fellow Americans, American Jews, whatever, to realize Israel and America are allies in the same struggle. Israel's in the front line the way West Germany was during the Cold War and Vietnam and Korea. But on a deeper level, I'll tell you something, and this is where the religious ideology of Christian American right and Israel come together. You have to appreciate that what's really going on is an attack against a way of life and values. Israel, America is being attacked because of what it stands for, certain values. And where are the source of those values? The Jewish people and the Bible. There's no question in my mind. And there's a, just a quote I want you to look at here. Go to, go to page number six. John Adams, second president of the United States. Look what John Adams says. This is the bottom shared values. We've got to get George Bush to read this, you know. I will insist the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. If I were an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. If I were an atheist of another sect who believed or pretended to believe that all is ordered by chance, I should believe the chance had ordained the Jews to preserve and propagate to all mankind the doctrine of a supreme, intelligent, wise, almighty sovereign of the universe, which I believe to be the great essential principle of all morality and consequently all civilization. Or look at Woodrow Wilson, quote number two. 
The laws of Moses as well as the laws of Rome contributed suggestions and impulses to the many institutions which are to prepare the modern world. And if we could but have the eyes to see the subtle present habit, both as regards the sphere of private life and as regards the actions of the state, we should easily discover how very much besides religion we owe to the Jew. This is the idea more than anything else that we have to start spreading. America and Israel ally strategically in the same struggle and allies ideologically. No one's doing anyone any favors here. Not Israel to America, not America to Israel. But I just want to end, because we really are running out of time, on a little bit higher note here. Because the scenario I painted doesn't look too positive. The best we can hope for, like beating the Arab world down till they just leave us alone, and they make these peace treaties, which if you live in the Middle East, you realize aren't worth too much, like our warm peace with Egypt, our warm peace with Jordan. I mean, really not. It's not like, you know, Italy and France and, you know, America and Canada. We have to appreciate there's something deeper going on. I want to just, you know, I'm a rabbi first and foremost. And I'm I'm also a student of Jewish history. And one thing I know from Jewish history is we Jews have always believed that we have a unique mission in history. We're supposed to be a nation that lives in a unique piece of real estate, Israel, which is not a place for Jews just to be like anyone else, but a nation that makes a unique nation that's a light unto nations, that is a model for the rest of the world. And if you guys come tonight, that's the whole topic of my book and what I talk about later. But that we've always viewed as, as the role of the Jewish people in history. Throw in one more idea and it all comes together. We just also believe in a God who acts in history. There's no accidents in this world. And because we've chosen for ourselves a unique responsibility, we are in the limelight constantly. Charles Krauthammer said it beautifully. Jews is news. You ever notice how Jews are always in much more news than non-Jews? Whenever a Jew does something wrong, it's ten times more news. Israel's constantly in the media. That two-thirds of all UN resolutions passed since 1990 are condemning Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East with free press and free speech. Does it bother you a little bit? You see it though, right? You know, it bothers me, it makes me angry, but if it was any other way, I'd be really worried. Because according to how we Jews understand history, that's the way it has to be. Because we understand traditionally, throughout all of Jewish history, we from Abraham onward chose for ourselves a unique position of responsibility in human history. And responsibility means accountability. And responsibility means you are the chief protagonist in the ultimate drama of human history. The spotlight is always on us. We are the point man in history. Like an infantry unit going out on patrol, we're out in front supposed to be leading the way, which is why we're always catching it as a nation, individually and as a nation. So if you understand that and throw in one final point, then it all comes together. If we understand we're a unique nation with a unique responsibility, and the world even subliminally knows that, which is why they're always picking on us and talking about us and having this incredible double standard, put that together with one final idea, and I think it all comes together. And that's the notion of, if you look at our historic mission in history, and when bad things happen to Jews, you look in the Bible, what is the traditional Jewish response? Everything that bad that happens on the outside, like in the book of Judges, when the Philistines, it's not an accident that our nemesis and the judges were taking the land from us, same name as today, Palestinians. When the Philistines attack Israel, the Bible describes it as, and the people of Israel did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. We blew our relationship with each other. We blew our relationship with God. We started acting like non-Jews in our Jewish homeland. And what happened? Someone came from the outside and gave us, as we say in Yiddish, surus. And then what do the Jews do in Judges? It's interesting. Well, they've got to defend themselves physically. You don't rely on miracles. But the first thing they do is get their act together as a people. Okay. Being Jewish. Being unified. And only when we do that does the external threat disappear. Now, that's what the Bible shows you, but I'll tell you something. It's exact parallel today. You know the two greatest signs, by the way, in Jewish history of God's displeasure with the Jewish people? How does he manifest his displeasure with us? It's not by the stock market dropping 40 points. Well, that definitely hurts Jews where it hits Jews where it hurts. Listen to the two biggest problems. The traditionally, it says it in the, in the Shema prayer, we say. The, no rain and the land being chopped up slowly and given to non-Jews. What's the two biggest problems Israel has today? No rain, which you don't even hear about. The water shortage is terrible. You don't even hear about it because why? Because the political situation is so bad because the land is being chopped up and given to non-Jews. Put that in the context of the traditional Jewish understanding of Israel and and our mission and our role and what the solution is. It all comes together. I'll tell you what the solution is. Short term, we've got to defend ourselves. We've got to be strong. We've got to get allies with America. We have to know how to negotiate with the Arabs. But ultimately, there's only one solution to this problem. We have to get together and do what we're supposed to do as a people. You know, in the words, you guys know the, the, the Israeli national anthem, Hatikva? It says, Liot am chofshi be'artsenu, to be a free people in our land. Beautiful words to the song. But I have one problem with that word chofshi. It's not an accident, by the way, that merits the extreme left-wing anti-religious party in Israel has as their bumper sticker, Liot am chofshi be'artsenu. 
It is not the mission of the Jewish people. We did not outlast the greatest empires in human history and do the impossible by founding our state after 2,000 years of exile to create a little you know, version of New York on the Mediterranean with high-tech and falafel. I can guarantee you all the money I have in the bank, which isn't that much, we will never have Shimon Peres' vision of the New Middle East. Okay? I guarantee it. The only solution, I promise you, 100%, it might sound weird to you, what do you mean? I guarantee it. the only solution we'll ever have to the Middle East crisis long term is when the Jewish people start doing what the Jewish people start, are supposed to do in history, which is be a light unto nations, and to create a homeland which represents the Jewish values that change the world. Now, the Kreisenberger Rebbe said it beautifully. When Jews don't make Kiddush, Gentiles make Havdalah. When we don't fill the world with what we're supposed to be filling, Jewish values, all the things that the world has accepted, I mean, I'm not giving myself a sales pitch, but come tonight, you'll see it. That utopian vision we're supposed to give the world, it'll just be filled with something else. And when it gets filled with something else, they're going to come after the Jews in general and Israel specifically. So this is a big call for everyone to be educated, to be proactive, to be proud. Most importantly, I think the number one thing we have to work on is to be unified. I'm not asking Jews to agree. That's like impossible, you know. But at least to learn to disagree in a way that is civil and realize that we are family and there's limits to how acrimonious the debate can get between siblings. You don't start throwing knives and chairs at your parents and your siblings and you get in fights with them. If we attack each other, I guarantee you it's only going to get worse from the outside. But I'm sure also of another thing. If we come together, start to understand what it means to be Jewish, start to unify, start to be that nation we're supposed to be and have the impact that we know we can have in history, and I guarantee you, you will see the difference in human history. You know who said this beautifully? Golda Meir, she said, pessimism is an emotion the Jewish people can never afford to have. Thank you very much. What do I think of the Saudi proposal of Israel move back to the 67 borders the Arabs would recognize Israel? Basically, been there, done that. Um... First of all, the only reason the Saudis were, all, I mean, according to all the Middle East experts, was Saudi Arabia wasn't looking too good after bin Laden because that's, they were trying to, like, be more proactive and look, be placed in a positive light in the world media. But there's nothing new there. I mean, Israel offered it. So there's nothing, it's just a it's just fluff, as they say. Yes, sir. They're coming out now with the revisionism that there were 60,000 uh, Israelis and 40,000 Arabs in the war for independence. And yet, you don't see the... Uh, and coming out with pointing out that that's obviously false. And Wait, the Arabs, the Arabs are coming out saying there's 60,000 Israelis against 40,000 Arabs in the War of Independence? That's news to me. Okay. There's only 600,000 Israelis and 45 million Arabs in the Middle East at the time. How many combatants were actually fighting? It wasn't 45 million Arabs with rifles against 600,000 Jews, but it was five Arab armies. Again, and yeah, because, look, again, as with all things with re revising history, you know, they say not, not even God can change history, only historians can, you know? So, with all things reviving history, you have to have a fertile ground for it. Like, the media, unfortunately, loves to take this stuff up. And Israel is incompetent at, at answering these things, always. I agree with you 100%. Which is why you got, when you hear it, you got to write in and say, excuse me, it's just not true. Yes, ma'am. What reaction do I get when I speak to college students? It depends on the college student. If there's Muslims in the audience, they want to throw tomatoes at me. Um, actually, some of the worst reactions I get are from liberal, very liberal Jewish college students. I hate to say it. You got like, when you got a guy like Noam Chomsky in Harvard leading the move to boycott Israel, and he's supposedly a Jew, although he probably is not proud of that fact at all, it doesn't surprise me how, unfortunately, lots of Jews are very negative. And it points to a very interesting point in Jewish history. Some of the biggest enemies of the Jewish people are fellow Jews self-hating Jews like Adam Shapiro? Yes, ma'am. Christian Arabs are basically scared out of their minds. The reality is, if you look at the demographics of Arabs, Christian Arabs in the Middle East, whether it's Lebanon or Bethlehem, which used to be three-quarters Christian Arab and is now less than a third, or, or, uh, or Nazareth, which is also rapidly losing its Christian Arab population, they, on one hand, they realize that there's no future for them in the Middle East with the Muslims. On the other hand, they, they're petrified of coming out and saying anything, like Hanan Ashrawi, who I cannot stand, but is a Christian Arab. But she will never, ever come out and say anything critical of the Palestinian Authority and its gross mistreatment. If you know what's going on in Beit Jalla, for instance, which is where they fire a gilo from. They have gangs of the whole places, like, great example, Chicago in the 1920s. You know, There's just gangs of armed people running around, raping Christian women, you know, breaking into houses, shooting people in the place. And I think the big mistake that the Christian world, and this is the point I think we can all do, is the Christian world, we should, we should like, put a lot of money secretly into a campaign to save. It would be great. 
let's get a couple Christians tackle like front guys for us. Campaign to save Christianity in the Middle East. It would be a great thing. It would be a great thing to get the, supposedly the Christian Europe to wake up a little bit to the real dangers of what's going on. And their brethren are in trouble, you know. Yes, sir. Is it possible that their world will collapse? I mean, is it, is it possible that they're not going to be able to get their thing together and maybe that will diminish the strength of the Arab world? So the question is, it seems that there are divisions within the Arab world, fundamentalists, not fundamentalists, Sunni, Sunni, Shiites. There's definitely divisions, and I could say, thank God there are, because if they were really united, you should appreciate that the Saudis don't, are not threatened by Israel. They'll say it. Who are the Saudis petrified of? The Iraqis. You think, it won't be the worst day in the history of Saudi Arabia, the day his, Israel, God forbid, would cease to exist. Then the Arabs would all kill each other. So there's no question that's a big factor, but it's also no question that the one thing the Arab world can agree on is put their differences aside when it comes to Israel bashing. So, yes, it's a big benefit to us to appreciate that the Arab world is not monolithic, that some of the biggest support for the fundamentalists is coming from non-fundamentalist regimes. For instance, Iran is a fundamentalist regime. Iraq is not. Syria isn't. Yet they support Hezbollah. So it's a very complicated, I mean, it makes, it makes a chess game look simple. But it's a very complicated equation, and you have to appreciate that every Arab country has its own best interest. It's like Lord Palmerston, Prime Minister of England, 200 years ago said, His Majesty's government has no permanent friends or permanent enemies, only permanent interests. And ultimately, what fuels all foreign policy of any country, okay, it could be colored by fundamentalism, but ultimately, it's the internal or external political equations. And that's a very complicated. You know, why Syria does what it does versus Lebanon versus... But thank God, it's not so unified. Yes, sir. Um, no matter how you discuss it politically, isn't it truly the only answer for a Jew to do Torahs and Mitzvahs and come back to the uh, core of Judaism and follow the, our traditions? Is there any other answer other than that answer? <laughs> put me in a hard place as a rabbi here. Isn't the real only answer to, as a Jew is to be an observant Jew? Ultimately, to say otherwise would be, of course, not be true. I, as a religious Jew, believe, you know, that for sure the ultimate destiny of the Jewish people is to be a unique, holy people and to fulfill our destiny and sanctify ourselves and create a nation made up of people like that who are light into nations. So is that the ultimate solution? Absolutely. But there's lots of things we can do in the middle to ameliorate the situation. Even if Jews are not all religious, but we all agree to disagree in a nice way and just start to unify, you'll see a big improvement. You know, and it's interesting, the, the very famous saying of the rabbis, that God says, you know, open for me, you know, the door of Tshuva just a little bit and I'll throw it wide open so a wagon can drive through. If we just do a little bit as individuals, we'll see big changes. The, the, the one thing I want to, where, so to answer your question short, yes, I agree with 100% what you're saying, but it's not an all or nothing thing. It's very important to understand. It's not going to happen all or nothing. It all requires all of us to start definitely living as better Jews. Whatever we do to make ourselves better Jews will have an in, impact on the situation of not just the Jews in the world, but in Israel. I have no doubt about it. We should test it, see if it works. Any other questions? Yes, sir. There's that one thing, and I read this stuff all the time. It's great to run around and do the emails to all the Jewish people and right, right. Christian friends, but it's like you still got to have America, and, and it's like they're silent. Right. People, the question is a very good one. Jews have tremendous power in the United States media, 100%. A guy went to college with Lloyd Braun. He's the CEO of ABC Entertainment. I mean, this is a guy who's in position to do tremendous things. So why aren't we using that? So I'll tell you, it's very interesting. It has to do with, it's a very interesting topic, with the, the ambivalent identity of American Jews. Of, of, of not wanting, since, you got to understand, American Jews who came, all the people today are Jews in America, all of us, or probably most of us Eastern European Jews whose parents were religious Jews, great-grandparents were religious Jews who came 100 years ago from Russia. Most of our great-grandparents, unless you stayed religious, lost their Judaism and became Americans. And it's always been a big issue. It's not just Jews in America. It's an eternal issue in diaspora of what my identity is. Am I Jewish first or am I American first? How do I reconcile my Jewish identity with my loyalty to the United States? So many American Jews, one of the answers is, is they just feel that they have to be fair. Okay, because I'm American. I can't take sides because I might be Jewish and I might in my heart of hearts have sympathy for Israel, but that's not the right thing to do. And the other issue is, and I said this to the, a woman who asked me a question before over here, that you should appreciate that, that, unfortunately, many of the major Jewish personalities in the United States do not support Israel. 
they have, they're, they're very ambivalent about their own Jewish identity. And because the religion of American Jews, if you haven't figured it out yet, is liberalism, number one. And the Palestinians have been painted as the underdog, and they're not well educated. Some of the biggest supporters of the Palestinian cause are liberal American Jews, feeling that what Israel's doing is oppressive and apartheid-like, and it comes from a lack of a lack of Jewish pride, a lack of Jewish identity, a lack of Jewish education, all coming together. Put that in a Jew who has power and control, and you can have a very destructive person for the Jewish people. Whether it's this guy, like I always talk about Noam Chomsky, but he's a classic case, or Woody Allen, who signed a petition, I remember in the first Intifada, condemning Israel. There's tons of people like this. There's, there's tons of people, but that's very sad, but it's, not, but it's not a new phenomenon you should appreciate. But it all... One, but there's still... It, what's happened in Hollywood is that if you like George Bush, you won't get a job. It's almost just the liberals who are saying that, you know, believe in free speech and all this. That's a big topic. I'm not going to go there because I'll offend yeah. the Democrats. Okay. Any other questions? Is it? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, and maybe you could say a word about the terrorist activity in Israel. I mean, there's so many suicide attacks and bombing attacks. I mean, it seems that the Israeli population is totally demoralized. And Israel really has their hands tied. They can't really respond because uh, America, even though America is Israel's strongest ally, but yet they don't want Israel to come down too hard on the Arabs because they're not, they're not going to be able to build a coalition to attack Iraq, which they're not going to be able to build anyhow. But they're still a tiny American's hand. Maybe as a person who lives in Israel, you could talk about the feeling of the people to what's going on and uh, how the population is getting demoralized by the constant of terrorist activity. It's a heavy issue. Um, obviously, okay. I could say I lived in Israel 20 years. This is the worst it's ever been. I've been to the Gulf War and I've been to the war in Lebanon and I served in a combat infantry in the Israeli army. Um, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely the scariest situation, but you shouldn't think, I was saying when the sniper was in Washington, one guy with a gun disrupted far more of a much larger population than the 75 suicide attacks and the 14,583 attacks that have been in the last two years. And the shootings and the killings and the 600 dead and the over 600 dead and, the, and the many more wounded. So on one hand, it's depressing. The most depressing part is not so much the terrorism, but how it's hurt the business and the tourism. And I want to give you a pitch to everyone here. That you know the first people to stop coming to Israel? American Jews. I see, I'm a tour guide. Christian groups all over the place. Not as many as were before, but they believe God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. They've got to support the Jewish people. You go down to downtown Jerusalem, and it's store, every third store is closed, out of business. Hotels, empty. That's, the, that, that's more depressing to me than the, than the threat of terrorism. But look, it's a real thing. It affects me. It affects my kids. It affects my wife. We don't go out at night as much anymore. We're very careful. We let our children do where we let them go. Uh, but I have to, also have to say that it's much safer to raise your kids in Israel than, than the United States in most places. How many of you let your kids run around, leave the house for four or five hours, and you don't even know where they are? In America, you call the police. My kids go out Friday, you know, Shabbos afternoon. They go from, down to the park. I don't know where they are. Thank you. Poo, poo, poo. Blian hara. You know? So it's not, it's not like this horrible, you know, people who've never been to Israel think you arrive in Ben-Gurion Airport and there's like shells landing and you got a duck and they give you a helmet and like, please go into the foxhole and you'll have an armored personnel carrier take you to your hotel. When you go, you see that really, it's, you know, there are things going on and you got to be careful, but it's not this war zone. But it's definitely taking a toll and the inability of Israel to find a solution is definitely a bit disheartening. But on the other side, we saw when Israel went into the territories in Operation Hamat Magen, Defensive shield, usually I'll tell you, someone has served in a reserve unit for like 12 years, everyone in the reserve unit, normal reserve duty, you know, everyone knows in Israel you do three years of straight military service, then you get called back for the next 20 years to do reserve duty. Normally, everyone shows up, and there's one day when you have your reserve duty, before your reserve duty, you'll have to come in and, and explain why you can't come for your reserve duty. And I've done it several times because I've been abroad, I have to come, I have to change my dates. Like the entire unit shows up to try and get out of reserve duty. Because only a fool, the word in Hebrew is flyer, a sucker goes and does reserve duty in the army. But I'll tell you what we saw, and living next door to me is the uh, lieutenant general in charge of manpower for the Israeli army. He's the best guy to know. He's my next door neighbor. He said, I, I was at his house during Homot Magan in, in March, and he said, it's unbelievable. The turnout rate for the Israeli army in reserve units is 110%. He said, everyone is coming out. And not only people, that people who retired are coming back to serve in their units. And I'll tell you, an interesting side point, the, the, the Arabs basically, and this is their thing, we didn't, I didn't really have time to go into it, but they view the West as being weak. Jews are a mini version of the West. They're, they're, they're soft. We are not afraid to die. You hit a Jew, you hit a Westerner, kill a few of them, they run away with their tail between their legs. 
That's what they thought 9-11 was going to accomplish. And the whole goal of what Yasser Arafat's been doing, and if anyone thinks he isn't orchestrating the last two years, just don't know anything about the Middle East and what's going on, the whole goal has been make the Jews bleed. Because Jews, I'm sure that the answer to all of this is that there is no long-term solution to our situation with the Palestinians. The cat's out of the bag. Israel's not going to go reoccupy again. Getting back to the last point I made, you know, the traditional Jewish sources talk about how that God's going to get us to get our act together whether we like it or not. It's a very famous discussion in the Talmud about whether the Jewish people will be ultimately redeemed. And one rabbi says, well, if they get their act together, they'll be redeemed. And if not, they won't be redeemed. And the other rabbi says, they won't be redeemed. We know it's traditional. It's the biggest Jew of all Jewish prophecies, messianic era, return to Israel. So the, the, but the rabbi says, they'll be redeemed no matter what. But the worst case scenario is he will set a ruler over worse than Haman in the Purim story who will give us such difficulties that will, you know, like no atheists in the foxholes, will come back. And my, from my rabbinic historical perspective of what's going on, Israel has now been boxed into a situation where no matter how right wing you pick the leader, and Sharon is as good as it gets, I believe. I don't think Bibi Netanyahu is going to be any better, personally. That's my own personal opinion. The best we can hope for is a few years of quiet. But there's no long-term solution. And it's not because of George Bush doesn't let Israel do what it wants to do. It's because you're in a situation which, by all the natural laws, is both sides want the same piece of land, and one side is not willing to compromise. So, yeah. So I have a question. My, my fear is this. Is that the Arabs will finally get their act together and tell the Israelis, you're going to have to go back to the land that you gave them. And they'll be peace for two years, and in the second year, then they'll just kill all the Jews. That's, Israel can't defend themselves. That's really the way these, the Jews will, will, will run so fast for peace and turn their back on the Bible and the Torah that they'll have indefensible borders, believing their goodwill once and for all, and then be destroyed. So that's, I'm sorry, what's your name? Jeffrey. Jeffrey says, of ex- Jeffrey's greatest fear is also mine, by the way, in 1990, that the Arabs will actually shut up long enough to fake it that they want peace with Israel. Israel will jump on it, which, by the way, that's the, that's the history of the Oslo process from 1993 to the year, to the year 2000. And, and then they'll, Israel will get lulled into a false sense of security and be trashed. And they'll use the West Bank as the launching pad to, for the final assault against, like Hitler wanted to do. He'll get what he can from Europe by Sudetenland and Poland, or, you know, whatever. Again, then he'll go for the, the, the jugular at the end. That already has gone, that scenario. And I was petrified because when Barack offered everything, I said, oh my God, if Arafat takes it, Thank God he's a totalitarian maniac, and he, and he never loses a chance to lose a chance, Arafat. Because if he had any seichel, if he had any intelligence, he would have taken that. We would be dead. But that's already passed. And the one thing that's changed since Barack government till today is the vast majority of Israel, I don't know if you've seen people follow the polls and the politics in Israel, that if an election were held today, the, the Labor Party would lose about half of its seats. The Likud Party would double in size. The extreme left would always stay the extreme left because they're just living in absolute fantasy land. No, I kid you not. I kid you not. No, seriously. It's, it's the, the biggest religious fanatics I know are the extreme left in Israel. They don't, no matter what happens, no amount of terrorism, and no matter how many Palestinian textbooks and pictures call for the killing the Jews and Jews suck blood out of babies, and they still won't believe the Arabs don't want peace. But now, I guarantee you, you will A, not get a government in power in Israel in, the, in, the, in any time in the near future that's left-wing, and no one except the most blindly religious fanatic, you know, extreme person thinking that the, the Arabs still want peace is going to vote for such a government, the majority of the countries all swung to the right. They realize that you just, sorry, at the present circumstances, and unless there's a major change in the Arab world, I personally would say, and I believe, you know, I, I think we should have a whole land of Israel and everything would be great. If the whole Arab Middle East would become a democracy, I'd give them land. Because the only stable governments in this world are democracies. Okay, no democracy has gone to war with any democracy in history. Think about it. It almost never happens. Because democracy make peace with peoples. But since the chance of the Arab world becoming democratic, I have a much better chance of being president of the United States. I'm not holding my breath for that. But that's the only circumstance I think you would you'd now see a true change of heart in the Israeli electorate to vote for a government that would offer such a peace process. I guarantee you won't see it now in the future, in the not too distant. So we got through that, thank God. But I shared your concerns. Yeah. People, by the way, you don't have to feel, if you have to leave, I'm not insulted. I know people have to get back to work and things. Yeah. I get paid by the word, so I'll just stay here until, like, <laughs> yeah. Why, why did you say that the, uh, the collapse of the Arab world occur when there's Israel's gone? I'm saying, if, if the Israel were to cease to exist as the punching bag, 
as the way they can deflect. Why does Syria not make peace with Israel? Why does the Palestinian Authority doesn't make peace with Israel? Because the totalitarian regimes, just as the Soviet Union could not exist in, in a world of peace, because then they could not justify the horrible living conditions and the lack of democratic rights and personal freedoms of the population, so too the day Assad of Syria makes peace with Israel and opens up his borders is the last day that he's in power. And he knew that. He has to thrive in a state of conflict. All of these countries, you know, the Saudis are friends of America. Does anyone think Saudi Arabia is a friend of America? The biggest enemy state of the United States in the Middle East, in my opinion, is the Saudi Arabians. There's the potential to danger the United States. They hate America. It's the most primitive form of Islamic thinking. And the fact that they have oil for their allies. But they all have their own agendas. And they all hate each other. And they're all trying to survive and pass on their power. And the only thing that deflects everything else in the world from their problems and the, whether it's the disgruntled population or being invaded by another country is, is the punching bag Israel the scapegoat of the Middle East you know, I'm not, I'm not saying the whole Arab world would disappear if Israel ceased to exist God forbid a million times but you'd see like massive wars Iraq invading here this and there and that everything would fall apart so thank God for us <laughs> any other questions? thank you very much if anyone wants my email address or anything and if you're interested again tonight we're going to have a much more interesting in-depth conversation on Jewish impact on civilization. Sure.